Peter Drucker, the, the legendary management guru, said, if you want something new, you have to stop doing something old. And that's a great theme for today. If you want something new, you have to stop doing something old. So starting with that, I'm going to drop the first question over to, uh, to Lauren and Allison. You've taken a really bold position that communications needs, needs to define itself differently, defining itself differently. Talk about the communications role as you envision it. Yes, happy to. And Peter Drucker was more of a, of a visionary than people realize. Very special, very special person. And he was absolutely right. You know, what you sunset is as, as important as what you create. Anyway, we can't have a meaningful conversation about technology and communications until we have a clear but very different idea of what communications should be. And to try to use technology and analytics today for what communications used to do is a recipe, in my opinion, for disaster. Or at least disaster which means very low ROI for time effort, and money. So we have to reconceptualize, in my opinion, the progression of communications from a circulatory system of a company to a neurological nucleus of a company. And I think it's very achievable to go from amp just you know, a function that is meant to amplify a message to one that really sets up across a corporation a value added feedback loop, feedback loop is, is doable. Um, there's one slide, Nicole, I, I think we can show that tries to tries to put words around what this looked like. So you can see that management, you know, maybe in Peter Drucker's management manuals from the 50s, would have looked at this function as one that disseminates information to con key constituencies. And it's time for an update, which is that you can create value as a communicator by actually being a formator of an ecosystem within a company and around with the partners of companies. And I think partnering as a skill is something we want to discuss in more depth in this conversation, but this is where I think communications can and should be going. And it's not possible unless communicators are armed with insight and expertise. And that comes from the types of tools and solutions that the right partners can provide. So if we take what I think we're also quite good at, and the next slide says this too, a view of the whole, a sense of comprehensiveness, which is what we have. We have a real-time view. All of you as communicators know. We work at a speed that is unparalleled by any other function in the company. We have an outside-in perspective, and we have an extremely broad perspective. The communications teams that you lead support every nook and cranny of your enterprise, giving you an, a, a perspective that is unparalleled by any other function. And if you take those perspectives and you commercialize it into a, a consequential view where you're making recommendations, where you're being predictive about what themes and what horizons might be valuable to business decision makers, you've completely changed the value communications can demonstrate. Uh, to a company. You can expand the, the function from, you know, here's what we say, to being an organization, a function that basically helps leaders ask better questions. And that means asserting new types of, of expertise. Lauren, you and I were talking about this the other day, and, and you said part of your definition of communications is becoming more of an, an intelligence organization instead of simply PR communications function. That's pretty bold because you're now shifting your comms team from being, as you said, this, this, you said it's an ecosystem of the company. So is that part of that intelligence organization you're creating now? And you have all these customers far beyond that historically most of the CCOs on the call here have seen in their careers? I think so. I think part of part of the challenge which we can talk about is ensuring that partners' definitions of communi communication evolve with our own. Uh, but as an intelligence function, it's taking those perspectives and making them meaningful. So how do you make it meaningful to take everything that you see and give a portfolio view to your CEO versus other functions which have very deep technical siloed perspectives? And Peter Drucker, to just to quote him again, I love that you invoked him, called when he developed the science of management, he called it the liberal art. And there are fewer and fewer uh, meaningful generalist and generalists and liberal artists in management. And 
we must take what is a business acumen and the liberal art of management, partnership skill, bring that together with the perspectives. And now you're providing counsel that's completely up-leveled from the type of very narrow expertise that partners may think communications, may assign to communications today. So um, there's a slide, Nicole, also here that I'd love to show, which kind of shows a progression of how that conversation can uh, how you go basically from being a communications function to, a, to an intelligence org. You, you all know, you know, if you have two axes here, um, one is strategy, one is execution. So you earn trust by executing well. You have more impact, of course, if you demonstrate strategic value. And we all know you can pretty much map your own experiences to this curve, but send this out as a channel question. Draft this for me is a content question. The most interesting balancing point in my view on how you go from being just a comms organization to an intelligence organization is when you convert a communications problem, you can convert a communications problem to a business problem by defining it better and getting better questions um, out of your leaders. And then as soon as you start to earn the right to assert your perspective on a business problem, you're part of the vision shaping conversation as well. So if you're an intelligence company, communication is going, is going to be highly engaged in the upper right-hand quadrant. If that's, you know, I think growth companies are a little, where they're very focused on value, a little higher along this curve. It seems like a game changer in a lot of ways, Lauren. And looking at this, I would imagine that the skill set that one has to have to be a CCO it's, it's quite different than, say, five or certainly 10 years ago. Almost like it's almost like the, the Drucker. We keep coming back to him, but it's almost like the, the Peter Drucker of, of career, which is you have to shed off some skills that really aren't as appropriate versus to make room for this broader set of skills. So what would you see as the skills necessary to be a great CCO now and going forward, at least for the next few years as this evolves? The number one skill, and it's so undervalued, is the ability to orchestrate the skills of others around a problem. So what is the expert, what is the problem, what is the question, and what expertise is required? And then bringing that expertise together in the right, the right equation to advance things along. That skill of orchestration is, it's not coordination, it's not alignment, it's something more. It's, it's, it's a, a skill where you can see and penetrate to the heart of a problem, see what connections need to be made, and assemble, uh, nowhere, to, nowhere to procure, but then correctly assemble the right expertise around that problem. That to me is the number one skill, and it's a skill that, that takes practice, to be honest. Let me, let me drop one over to Allison here, because I think she can add something here. In, in following what Lauren's saying, you're touching a lot of different parts of the organization than perhaps communicators normally do. Maybe, Allison, you can add, what other departments are you working with that if you look at the portfolio of a CCO, say, five, ten years ago, versus your portfolio, which you and Lauren are doing together, what are the groups you're touching and talking with and working with that perhaps other communicators might scratch their heads and say, really, that's part of your job description? So perhaps you're going to add a little more insight into that. So, so we basically work with any functions within the organization that are accessing or using data. So that can be our, our IR team, that can be our um, asset management group and leveraging some of the technologies that they've developed. It's also even our global security team. So basically what has begun to happen, at least within Prudential, is that there are groups coming together or coalescing around um, if you touch a particular piece of data where it could have value for your immediate function and potentially others, there's a lot of collaboration happening. I think that started primarily around social media, but we've started to see that happen with other technologies that are coming to the fore. So um, machine learning uh, technologies and platforms, some that are developed in-house, some that are market solutions. There's a lot more platform sharing uh, and partnering that is happening. I wanted to make one comment there as I, as I watched Lauren um, go through the curve and it always sparks new thoughts. I've seen it so many times, but every time she talks about it, there's a, a new thought prompt there. I, I think one of the riskiest points when we talk about ComTech is the idea of being seduced by the technology. So I, I truly appreciate that we're starting this conversation with Lauren talking about the curve and talking about questioning, because what often happens, to just bring it back to your question, Eric, 
is that we're working a lot more closely with technology, with technologists. And technicians are highly, highly literal. So they follow the code, they follow the script, they follow the requirements to the letter. That means that we have to think broadly about the problem and we have to think about that, the immediate problem and surrounding problems so that we can help our technology partners be more effective in developing the solutions that will help us answer that big question in the center. So where there's risk is getting seduced by technology, where there's risk is assuming that technology solves the problem versus starting with the question, starting with the human and working through a process. Technology enables, but it doesn't immediately solve. You know, it's funny you should talk about technology and that, that triggered a, a recollection. Um, uh, Lauren was talking about the New York Auto Show last year, looking at self-driving cars. And she has a great story about that experience and how it per changed her perspective or modified her perspective on technology. So Lauren, that'd be a great little uh, little story to share, I think. Yes, yes, so absolutely, yes. So I don't drive, I mean, I can drive, I have a driver's license, but I live in a city and don't really drive. And I had never been to the York, New York Auto Show. And... I always feel like you should do something that's so out of your realm every now and again, this, uh, just to kind of learn this, you know, learn something that wouldn't normally impact you. So, you know what? I had the opportunity to go to the New York Auto Show. And uh, a very interesting connection is many years ago, I was a fellow of the Bosch Foundation, which is a major auto supplier. So it was sort of a little full circle moment. Anyway, I went to the New York Auto Show expecting a complete... Uh, you know, a total, you know, everything would be about self-driving cars that we would see, get to try the self-driving cars. And you know, it was, a, it's a global event. I mean, it's a really global event and there were all kinds of new car designs. It was very interesting to me. And I had the chance to ask people like what have been the most important progressions in automotive technology in the last few years. And not one of them said self-driving ability. They talked about the telematics that make it easier and more pleasant for drivers. They talked about pedestrian safety because basically driver safety has been solved. And I finally said, like, well, what about self-driving? It's all I read about is like self-driving cars. And I used to be in the PNC insurance business and everybody was like, who insures a self-driving autom uh, automobile? And the answer from the whole industry was like, until you have the total infrastructure around the self-driving vehicle, it will never be operationalized. So we are at least a decade from it. And you can try them out until you have highways that are only for self-driving cars. You're not gonna see them on the road. And this was, this was the view of, of pretty much every major global automaker with the exception of Tesla, which is not present at the New York Auto Show. You know, it's fascinating that for years they've said that people tend to um, overestimate the speed, how fast technology is gonna come. They think it's going to happen faster than it really does, but often under is, it underestimate the actual impact on our lives. Yes. That's, that's, it could be another great example of that because you have self-driving cars. You don't need garages and driveways. Just get a car and go, you know? Right. I'm, I'm going to sort of pause here and flip it back to, to Elliot. Uh, I think some people may have put some questions there, whether it's public questions or just send them privately to Elliot. But uh, I think he's got a couple to float to you guys in this first section here. So, Elliot, you're, you're back on. Great. So I'll give people a moment here if they want to put a question in the chat. I don't see any yet, uh, but would welcome them and look out for them. Um, so I, I, I guess a, a question for, for Lauren, um, how, how have you kind of prioritized uh, the approach that you've taken and, and how do you uh, sort of shape or sell or justify the budget needed to do that to the CEO? The... I was fortunate because I, I, I came into a position where they knew they were needed to be, a, it was a moment of, okay, we need to reshape communications. And in that moment, I had um, a leader who sat over the brand budget and he recognized how important these investments were. And he, he really, he grew up in advertising and marketing, but he really invested in understanding deeply what made communications special and different. And in his view, communications was equal to marketing and brand. It wasn't beneath it. It wasn't just an amplifier of marketing activity. So he did, in fact, I mean, borrow from the brand budget to give, make the seed investments, which were not that expensive in what it is that we were trying to do. And of course, I had to make a business case. Um, we had to get business buy-in, but I didn't ask for a special budget. I did do one thing. I made a commitment to self-fund and I was appalled. I mean, you probably all have this. There were so many subscriptions to things running around 
and a big corporation. And by the time you consolidate it and say, listen, I just found X amount of money. I'm going to reinvest it in new and different partners. It wasn't so hard. It took about 18 months um, to, to be, build the business case, understand what questions mattered to the business. Business was easier than enterprise, I have to say, but what mattered to the business then what mattered to the enterprise it was wonderful to have a backer with a little bit of seed money and um, very quickly through just uh, that investment and self-funding, we got to where we needed to be. And the more value we demonstrate, the more people are chipping in to say, you know what, I want to go in with you on that because it helps answer a question I have that my area has had for a long time. The other piece that, that we're doing in terms of, and this is to the question that just appeared in the chat, in, in terms of partnering with marketing and, and other adjacent functions is uh, very early on when I came over to Prudential, it was about two years ago, one of the first meetings I had with Lauren was like, these are all of the other people using data. These are the tools they've built. These are the tools they've had. They have go forth and explore. And, and through that initial exploration, usually what happens is you start the conversation with, let's um, maybe just share costs. But yeah. back to my earlier point, it's become work groups and getting more value out of the work that we're doing because we're actually collaborating on the intelligence. So I'll use one example. We uh, share and co-invest in a number of different tools with the marketing organization. Um, they are responsible for distribution. We are tracking for issues, but the functionality of the platforms is, is shared. When we're looking from an issues perspective, they also use tools like um, Medallia, for example, where they're fielding surveys. We meet on a regular basis to look for the intersections where we're seeing commonality between what we're seeing in social and what they're seeing in survey work. So the idea of being able to partner, to collaborate, and to sort of triangulate what they're seeing with the data sets that we have has been very valuable. So their case becomes stronger. They become more valuable to their business partners. We're also able to bring back a level of intelligence that validates the work that we're doing. And so it becomes mutually beneficial. And that's how the partnerships have deepened from just sharing of tools and subscription rights and access to actually partnering on intelligence to get a better insight intelligence outcome for the organization. Allison, thanks so much. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Lauren. No, no I was gonna say, I see another building on that, uh, that point. We, the, what Allison has been able to do is put us on equal, definitely equal footing with partners and they see us differently because of the better intelligence outcomes we achieve for them. The thing that, the, a definitional con continuum that has helped a lot for us is understand, you know, you put your customer at the center of what you're trying to do, but there are, there's a continuum of issues and there's, and needs. And communications very clearly can provide context intelligence on issues that surround a customer and inform the customer's needs and the marketing teams understand the needs. It's, it's, a, it's, you know, two directions and you sort of meet in the middle. But what we've done in our collaborations, and as Allison's saying, it's not just data sharing, it's, you know, a different type of assembling around a problem is bringing issues expertise to needs-based problems. And that, that, to me, that continuum has enriched our partnerships with marketing and brand deeply. Thank you, Lauren, that's helpful. So I do see, just quickly, we've got a couple of people with questions in the chat. Anga Dunstelman, who's with, uh, with Royal Phillips, Anga, did you want to follow up on your question or have we covered it? I see they're peeking into the chat to see if- Thanks, it's Angie, by the way, but thank you. Oh, my uh, apologies. No, I think that you, I think that you covered it. Thank you. Um, I would be very keen to see if you have anything to, to um, explain further that model on the issues and needs. I think that's very interesting. Um, so, yeah. One thing that we have done, so I see you specifically asked about audience strategy. So our, um, market research team, which is sitting within the marketing organization, did a huge segmentation study um, a, a couple of years ago. And, you know, the challenge with the huge segmentation study is that it cannot be refreshed regularly. You're on maybe a three-year cycle if you're lucky. And so what we work to do is we partnered with them. We developed proxy segments leveraging our social tools. And now what we're setting up are segments that we're listening to on a regular basis. It was, we did it in par close partnership with that organization. We worked with their methodologist and developed something that we all felt comfortable with. So now we have an ongoing intelligence mechanism to continue to refresh their view of their segments. And so it's become particularly valuable, if it's, as we've seen over the past few months, 
the complete change in the economy from where we were in December, we have COVID now as an issue, we're able to get product insights, we're able to understand how different segments respond to things like the CARES Act, which is important you know, to all of our businesses. We can get those insights and then share that back to the market research team and funnel that through into marketing. But it has to be, again, that very deep partnership where we know you have an initiative and we're thinking about what can we contribute with our closest partners to help you create an ongoing intelligence mechanism, a way to calibrate against issues and get even beyond a survey, for example. And that's an area where we've been quite successful in our partnering uh, with a marketing organization, leveraging that type of capability. Great, thank you so much. So I see one or two other questions that I know we'll be able to come back to. Let me hand it back off to Eric here. Great, great, thanks, Elliot. So section number two here, we spent a little time talking about analytics and intelligence uh, numbers here. And I'm going to throw this one out. Uh, I think, uh, Alice, you might want to grab this, or maybe Lauren's on a, on a roll here. Uh, you talk about communicators seem to want to measure in the past what was easy to count. Things like clip counts and add value equivalent, which we won't even say those dirty words again, and, and just raw impressions. But why has it taken so long to move past some of those old metrics that have been hanging over us for so long and what should take their place? What are you finding to be helpful? Because you're thinking in a whole different way than perhaps many communicators at least have historically thought. So what, what's taking its place and how are you getting there and why is it taking so long? I'll just do one minute on what even less than that on this question. It's, it's, it's not easy, but uh, the question is like, how do you going from measuring what you've done to doing work that informs where you should be going? That is a foundational change in mind and in, 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 in mindset for, for people and for ourselves and for partners, because it, yes, to some degree, how did you do is can inform what you do next but there was so little white space thinking about where to go. And even just, you know, I'm going to do this amount of assessment to get to a better question. Permission to proceed. Yes, it is. It is that shift of measurement looking backward versus predictive where we're going. Anybody can look back and say, how did we do? Um, but the question is on what and how do you isolate the contribution of communications to something that's often much larger? What can communications offer that's unique and special and differentiated? And it's almost always what does the future look like? And Allison can expand on that, that point, but I have to, I can't underscore enough the, the retrospective mentality versus the prospective mentality and how you look at, at, at research. Yeah. I mean, uh, to be honest, I think uh, oftentimes it's harder. It requires a different level of partnership. So when you're just looking at a raw input and you're measuring, that's very different, Eric, than, as you know, the type of relationship that we have with you, the type of relationship that we have with other partners like Morning Consult, where we're, we're constantly engaged in a conversation and we're reaching out to talk about, to Lauren's starting point, a question, a problem, an issue. And it is about how do we use this data to understand sort of the state of the world, the evolving state of the world in which we operate, and what is that implication for how we go forward? So yes, we're using, I mean, all modeling is based on the data that we have now, thinking about the future, but it's a different application. We're focused on how is this helping inform what I'm going to do next versus applauding what I did yesterday, a week ago, a month ago. And I think that's the critical difference. I also think that, you know, I will admit, I, I've worked at agency, as you know, for a number of years. I'm fortunate to, to have a leader like Lauren in the CTO position who has a view that, you know, we're not competing with marketing. We're complementary on equal footing and we tackle different types of problems. I think a lot of ABE and impressions is about communications, really PR and the media relations side, wanting to fit into a, a marketing centered structure. And I think that's not acknowledging the full value of communications, the broad set of st stakeholders that we serve and as Lauren often says that communications op operates up here, you know, above when we get into the marketing funnel. And we have to think that way and also evaluate our partners against that type of a criteria because it's a different type of work and it's a different mindset that's brought to the work and brought to the analytics. Yeah, one of the things that uh, we've been seeing a lot more of is, is data correlation, understanding not necessarily cause and effect, you gotta be careful drawing conclusions too quickly, but data correlations, because they're suggestive of where you're having effect in the marketplace. Uh, and the more you see that, the more you say, okay, let's, to your point, let's go forward, let's think forward, let's try this out and see what it does. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, I keep looking backwards and it's like trying to drive a car, you know, backwards through your rear, rear view mirror, it's very dangerous, you know? 
So um, I want to flip around, talk about the, ter the term PR software tool. And this tool phrase is, you know, gives me hives sometimes because it's, but it's thrown a lot. People are looking for a, a turnkey piece of software that will give them all the coverage, all the answers and prove their worth just by turning on that little circle button that says, give me the answers. Prudential though has moved through that phase. And, and really, I think you've said it doesn't really work that way, the way you guys look at it. It's not this push a button, you get it. Talk about your journey uh, from a consumer of this raw technology tools that are out there to your current model, using technology fairly aggressively, but more as an ena enabler than a solution unto itself. And then how you use that uh, and use your partners to move the ball forward. It's a different way of thinking. So could you share that a little bit? So I, I'll start unless you want to jump in, Lauren. No, no, I, I, I'll take the opportunity. Allison goes first, but I'll take the opportunity to tell you all of the mistakes I made. <laughs> so many, so many until we hired Allison. So I'm, I'm happy to spend time on that. So no one else on this call has to, has to repeat that pain. Well, I, I can start with the intro moment when I, when Lauren first mentioned the role and, and she started the conversation with inviting me to, she's like, just come in and look at my newsroom. And I'm like, Okay, sure. Happy to you know make the journey, and I, I respect Lauren tremendously, so I was happy to have the conversation at lunch. And she brought me into this amazing uh, space that was data rich. The whole idea of creating uh, an environment and a and a mindset tools based. And what she said to me is, she's like, I, I bought, I've built a Ferrari, and now I have the keys and no one to hand them to. So like, will you take the keys? I was happy to take the keys, but I think that story illustrates that. Getting the buy-in on the technology and the tools doesn't matter unless you have the right team. And I would say that we've spent as much time graciously with Lauren's leadership and advocacy to be able to onboard tools and simultaneously onboard talent and a, a talent that has a broad range of capabilities. So it's everyone who has, from someone who has expertise in editorial content and, and really strong news judgment, like we have people on my team who are former editors from, from, uh, from Bloomberg, for example. So that idea of human judgment is critically important, social media analysts. And then I have you know, my data scientist track where they're working in Hadoop, Impala, they're creating data lakes, their dashboards, all of that. So you need this kind of broad spectrum to be able to meet the needs for external media, but increasingly and more importantly, internal. And being able to, in a very robust and focused way, analyze internal communications, because now we're seeing that same onboarding of platforms inside of the house that we were focused on social and everything else a few years ago outside, inside. So I think software tools, I think, is dangerous. And often that's the first question, what tools do you use? Most of them will do a broad range of things. You have to think about it in terms of not just the tool, but the team and the talent that's going to surround it. And you also have to start that team and talent conversation with your partners. Anyone who comes in to sell you on just a platform and pushing a button and says it will solve everything, it's not being honest. It is, and I would say I spend far more time, Eric, you know this, talking to your team and have mem members of my team talking to you, talking to Darren and others. It's true for Morning Consult as well. Um, we, we have, who are also shared partners, we developed that partnership together. The idea of, you know, we are on the phone, we're discussing issues, it's a collaboration. If you have someone who's just a software platform vendor, that's not a partner and it's not gonna solve anything. You'll be very disappointed uh, if that is your, your starting point and, and end point for that conversation. I, I'm curious if Lauren's willing to share, she says, I've all these mistakes I made. I actually loved it. Seriously, this is totally unscripted. I would yeah. love to hear some of those you think are relevant to the conversation. Just a couple anecdotes saying, I tried this and didn't work because clearly where you and Allison are is a whole level of sophistication and it's based on real world experience and probably real world, world pain that mm -hmm. you found a way through. But if you're willing to share some of those totally unscripted, I'm putting you on the spot here, but yeah, to share course. a couple of those pain, that'd be great stories I think would help people understand how you got from there to here. Yes, I listen, I made every mistake everyone would be making. I just started a little bit earlier um, because it was actually 10 years ago that I started to understand the role of artificial intelligence in media. And so I had asked the questions that everybody's asking, maybe just a little ahead, but I made every mistake. And it was exactly that, a tool. Then, okay, I have a tool and I have someone to, a junior to kind of manage the tool who doesn't really have a lot of the news or human judgment, hasn't been developed in that. Okay, that's a mistake. Or, so I'll tell you, I mean, I made every mistake asking the wrong questions, questions that were too big, questions that were too narrow. 
Um, and finally, I took a step back to say, okay, this is about a portfolio of partnerships, not tools. Let me get build buy-in around questions before I get to the capability building. Let me then approach this as a capability that has enterprise value, not just value to our world. And then the last thing I did, um, which you know, again, based on all kinds of mistakes was I thought, well, I'll just share passwords with people. <laughs> we'll, we'll just share passwords and then you know, we, everybody can access the data. Nope, you need to create a physical environment and now it can be a virtual environment, but an envi the in building the environment sells. It builds the culture of data sharing. It builds a, it builds a sense of capability um, as you know, I found, you know, listen, we were able to hire Allison because we could sell through the physical environment of our newsroom. It didn't cost anything to put screens together that took what it is that our partners offer us and have it be for anybody to walk through and see. I can't tell you how long it took, how, how, how much earlier I would have done it that way if I had realized how impactful that would be. So the, the worst mistake I made was I, if I invest in this tool, not resourcing it with the talent to manage it. And then once, you know, thinking broadly, it's actually a team of talent that combines as Allison te Allison's team does today, the data analytics track with the news judgment track and a lot of skill sets in between. I hope that's helpful. I mean, it was more painful than I care to admit, but I'm telling you all right now, was, I just make every mistake just maybe a few years before everybody else. So basically the, the switch just to say that our, our capability is really not relying on a single tool of partners. So we need different partners that have strengths in different geographies. And so that already gets you started with you need um, sort of a suite or a stack. We don't lead with the tool. We talk about a technology enabling what we do, but to say that there's a PR software tool that would solve all our problems you know, that's just not how we think. We leverage it. We leverage market solutions as well as an enterprise, but it's an enabler. It's not the solve. You know, we as humans are the solve. We also focus a lot in terms of partners on integration. And so, you know, we try to do that internally and we've shared some of that, but Eric, you know, and I think Michael might be on the line as well. The, we think about integration also with respect to our partners and we're looking for partners that are willing to partner because there was so much conversation around in comms, big data, but in fact, to a large extent, we never got there because it was a lot of homogeneous data in high volume. So now we're looking at the right data and how do we bring the right data sets together using different partners, fostering collaboration that we are beginning to see already just in a few months is lending to new insights, better levels of intelligence um, that we would have gotten if we tried to think of our, our tools as discrete and siloed versus looking at the data and, and having it come together. And then we've talked about this as well, the idea of future forward. So that's part of how we think about um, the priorities for our organization, but future forward is also how we evaluate partners. Like one of the things, whether it's your team or, or Michael's team and, and other partners that we have, the value of our partners being forward focused. So one of Lauren's criteria actually, and we've discussed this quite a bit, it's like, here's kind of the budget. This is what we have to work with. And that idea of you have to think about what you're going to continue or what you're going to invest in, but you also have to balance that with where you're going to pull back. Lauren's criteria is who are the partners that we can work with deeply? And then as we're evolving the communications function and thinking about our future forward, our tracking with us. So the idea of just having a tool is great in any point in time, but you really need the partners that have a constant development pipeline that are thinking about innovation and iteration so that they can keep pace with just the involving environment and also your changing needs. So I think th these are, this is sort of our framework and criteria when we think about our own work as well as our partners. Um, you know, the common theme that you've been mentioning is how you're working with all these other departments, you're bringing in data, making it available to everybody. So you all have a common language. And so you've expanded, your comms team has expanded the scope of the inputs you're taking in far more than many, many, many communications teams out there very, very forward thinking. So could you share some examples of some of these new data sources you, you're using as so much as you're not giving away competitive knowledge, but you know, what you're willing to share, what are some of these new data sources you're using and what are you looking for in those data sets? So we, over the past years, you know, we, we started initially on media data. We partnered with, with your organization because we wanted to understand, get an enterprise view. So some of it's not new data, 
it's just expanding it, making it more robust and going deeper. So that's what we did on the, on the earned media side. On the in-house internal communication side, we've been building out a lot of systems where um, in the past, it's like, oh, how many people read that internal, you know, internet article? We're now using segmentation. So it's how do you parse the data that you have more finely so you could do more sophisticated things with it? How do you visualize it better so that you get better intelligence? So I would say it's probably less doing things that are entirely new or different or data sets that we never had access to. It's how we parse them. I mentioned earlier the example of social, social segmentation. For quite some time, it's like, who's talking about my brand? And yes, we can get that. But now we want to understand who's talking about issues. We want to understand how the conversations about issues align with different segments that represent uh, key targets within our customer base. We also want to understand how does that parse by geography, both within the U.S. and globally, as we see more differences in opinions and need states um, evolving from an economic perspective. And so the idea is not necessarily that we're, we're looking for entirely new data sets. It is just how do we approach the data that we have in a more nuanced way? And that's when it gets back to partners that can run with you on segmenting and parsing, um, but also part thought partners that are going to help you think through, is that really the way that you want to approach manipulating the data to get to the best answer to your question or the best solution? Yeah, that was what I was just going to add was, I think the thing that our team was most impressed with working with Lauren and Allison was the questions that they asked. And I just would say for everyone, like, for your vendors, like you should be able to ask tough questions or thought provoking questions. Um, I mean, I literally had some of our top data science talent that was fighting to work on a white paper for them that was just addressing what was a really thought provoking issue. And I just, you know, I think to us, like that's what stands out about sort of the mindset of Comtech when it's done well is sort of the thought provoking nature of there's not gonna be an easy answer to every one of these questions. And in some cases, it's sort of just framing the questions for further study that are among the most important things. I think. The two things I took away you know, from our experience so far has been the ability to do segmentation and to drill into individual populations and be able to use real-time data. And the other is just, you know, we called it, you know, in this nature is sort of like, how do you score events? And it's just, it's a really fascinating question. And I just, I think that it's a philosophical change in the role to be able to ask more technical questions and also know like you're never going to recruit the staff individually that just comprehensively has every data science question. So good partners with good questions get to much better answers. Yeah, thank, I thank you for that, Mike. I thank you so much for that. Having, for us, there was a question in the chat about how you develop talent. The ability to partner and be a great partner is a, is a skill and it's one we work on developing. So it thrills me to, to hear this feedback, especially from you for, for our team, because we work at that and aspire, we wanna be the, we, our team, we say, be the best partner. So if you, if we, if you surveyed, our anchor partners and you said of all the people you work with, like where do where does prudential, where does the prudential team rank? Like that's a that's a goal we set for ourselves. That's very helpful. Um, um, I, I, just, I just wanted to jump on something from the chat actually, which was around haters and and <laughs> oh we have haters. <laughs> Sorry, it's it's just such a good prompt. Thank you, thank you, John, for for raising that. Um, John has also spent time with us and again that idea of collaboration and knowledge sharing. Um, you, you stamp down the haters, if you will, by being there first. And I would say having partners like Eric and Michael that can bring to us, we're working on a white paper, can you help us brainstorm? That allows us to socialize that we know things are coming, for example, to our uh, risk management team around how to understand how to calibrate um, how issues manifest in the media and how that impacts public opinion. So we can take advantage of opportunities to kind of educate senior leadership, which Lauren is particularly good at, of saying like, this is not a presentation, this is an education moment to show them that this is what comms intelligence actually looks like and bringing it to multiple stakeholders in risk management to our executive leader team, leadership team, et cetera. So the idea of, of haters questioning our data only comes into play when our data hasn't surfaced first. So when we take an example like COVID, we started like late January monitoring that as an issue. As soon as it started to break as something significant, Lauren, we'd already worked through with Lauren what our data looked like, what our internal meetings were going to be. And then we just started pushing out content to the organization around this is our view of how this, this issue globally is evolving and how you need to think about it. So, so the idea is if you're able to be ahead of the ask in, in many respects, it, it can help you stamp down the haters because then people are coming to you looking for that intelligence. So we became an intelligence resource for the marketing organization. This happened with George Floyd and racial equity. They were calling Lauren asking for like, what intelligence do you have and can we get on the distro? And so having partners that allow us to be in that position, whether it's 
Michael and, and Morning Consult and the survey work that they're doing or the media intelligence that we can get from public relay is incredibly um, important and allows you to be ahead. Now, one of the things we keep hearing out there in some circles is attribution or conversion-based metrics. Mm. And I, I watch your eyes on that one. React to that. When you hear that, what is your reaction? Are there as appropriate? Why or why not? It's low on the funnel. I mean, not that you can't be there, but like, you know, if this is the, the marketing funnel, like you have to, there's a lot of work that has to be done at this level before you get to this moment. And if you just have to know what your role is and what value you can add at each stage, but you know, overly focusing here and not up here is in my view, a mistake. Yeah. You're, what you're talking about is what happens at that, you know, usually last touch and, and we operate before that, you know, most of the modeling that a few years ago, was very popular, market mix modeling, et cetera. It's like 60% of people would have bought it anyway. Well, it's like, that's great. And where did that come from? Yeah, it's the air cover that comes. Yep. Right, it's how you tackle issues. It's the broader brand building. It's, it's regulatory stakeholders. It's just how you operate in the world has a lot to do with that. And that's where comms plays a much bigger role because the portfolio of stakeholders that have to be addressed through communications is broader than customer. When you talk about conversion, oftentimes that's very narrow customer focused, singular stakeholder, and we have to think about multiple. Mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause right here. And Elliot, do we have any questions that came in over the chat that you wanna cover or should we go into section three here? It does look like, so I have a question that I'll hold for a moment, but it looks like we have a question from Narayani. Would you like to speak up? So I'll read the question. Uh, Narayani asks, could you please elaborate on real-time monitoring powered by AI and machine language technology and communication? And could you also name some tools if you can? I, I'd love to just mention this. Um, this is an opportunity to sort of underscore, which is good, I think good for everybody. All of your businesses, all of your sectors, the businesses themselves have tools that they use to move their, move their business forward. And, and I, I've been surprised at how many capabilities certain companies have, you know, to take fundamental business tools often that are AI and machine, um, machine learning led and apply them to comms questions. You don't have to go very far. You just kind of have to know what are your businesses using in different ways. And an example at Prudential is that um, Prudential has one of the largest asset management um, businesses in the world. And of that big asset management business, we have quantitative um, and qualitative and, and fun, fund, fundamental equities businesses. And you know, portfolio managers do a lot of research. And they had very sophisticated tools that they were using to make investment decisions. But we realized we could repurpose them to answer communications questions. And to the point about AI and machine language, machine, machine learning, we all know the role of AI in media. We know that AI is you know, pushing out more content that you can imagine. You know that AI is being used by everybody from the SEC to portfolio managers to comb through earnings calls. So when you understand it, can you apply it to the type of content you're drafting to get a sense, you know, can you anticipate how algorithms are going to interpret your work? So when you look at, you know, real-time monitoring, Allison, I, I know can talk about, but the idea of understanding how AI and machine uh, learning and machine language technology and communication may already be applied in your businesses, especially if you're in a technology business or business with a, an extremely complex um, and sophisticated supply chain. If you just dig around, you can, start, you can convert things already being used for different outcomes to communications questions. Yeah, and I think to Lauren's point, the, the, this particular case, which has been quite successful, is really an acknowledgement that comms have to resonate with humans and machines now. And so the idea is that if you're adopting some of those tools that are detecting things that machines would detect and calibrating sentiment that way versus solely relying on, say, an individual or just the raw sentiment, say, in a social tool, um, which, is, which can be great. But at the end of the day, applying it to a sentiment algorithm that's been developed in the business, completely different. So the idea of figuring out how to communicate effectively both to human and machine is something to think about. Um, I think the other piece on real, t real time that I'll say is we do have real time monitoring, but it is very human. So again, I go back to my go-to really for real time monitoring is not any tool. It's a brilliant woman named Emily Fredericks Goodman on our team, former Bloomberg editor, who um, has incredible news judgment because 
what surfaces, let's say, in social and some of those signals may not necessarily be relevant for your business. And so you have to marry that real time, what pops in media with a lot of subject matter sector expertise and just journalism expertise. And so AI will help surface, but you still need a human that's going to help to calibrate and make sense of it. Yeah, Allison, you hit a very important point. We spent a lot of time and money over the years developing AI. And one of the most important things for all of us to realize is AI is very, very good at some things, like identifying stolen credit cards. It's incredibly good at fraudulent charges. Uh, targeting ads on and it chase you around for a pair of shorts all over the internet. That's AI a lot of times driven. But it has to be taught. And it has to be taught. The reason why stolen credit cards work is there's a feedback loop every day that was stolen or not stolen, and that it was a good transaction or not. In media analysis, to your point, Allison, what's training it for your specific business and your perspective? If anybody's bringing you an AI solution, the first question we all should ask is, what's your training model? AI has to be trained. That's a fact of AI. And unless there's a robust way to train it specifically to your business on an ongoing basis, because the zeitgeist changes constantly, it's going to struggle. Other areas, it does really well. And so part of our job as communicators when we use technologies like AI is as application. In some cases, it's a killer app. You know, is this the right application? Sometimes it's not the right because it just doesn't get the right answer because it's not getting trained properly. And it's not an easy problem to solve. We work with the MIT Media Lab and this is exactly what they tell us is that problem and that problem and that problem isn't even on the horizon to be solved by AI, even though marketers will tell you it's being solved because they're selling a product. In certain areas in our industry, not just in comms, they struggle. So, um, I want to. I was just going to say that comes back to the idea of transparency and just a caution point for tools. Like tools can claim to do almost everything, especially in the selling process, but be wary of the of the black box solution. So again, Eric's transparency around sort of telling you what the training model is and walking you through that process is very important, so you fully understand what you're getting. A lot of out of box solutions are you know, lead with the black box and it's proprietary and secret. How can you possibly operationalize that for the specific needs of your organization if there's not that level of transparency? I was going to move into the third section, but I saw one question come from Judy Rader. She was asking about uh, how have you engaged and trained your internal talent to become more strategic intelligence advisors versus traditional communications advisors. So we got smart people in this, this webinar right now, top to bottom, everybody here, but lots of people work for the people on the call here today. How do you get your team to move their mindset? I have to tell you that's about 30% of my job now. 30% um, of my job is the right type of curriculum, the right type of incentives for people. In addition to like just talent strategy, internal mobility, external recruiting, and so forth. But that, the ability to help communicators have an expanded view of what they can offer, particularly at a, a junior level, is an incredibly important investment of time. So how have you engaged and trained your internal talent to become more strategic? You can, it can be learned. And we gave everyone in our team uh, the goal of, of learning how to ask better questions, but also provide examples where you asked a question that moved a conversation forward. So we took what a better question can do uh, to a conversation and no matter where in our group you were serving or at what level you were serving. So a better, if you're more senior, you should be affecting business outcomes like the curve you saw through a question at that level. If you are junior and you're working in a very specific um, area there's still great questions you can ask and people were uh, asked to give examples and we we recognize people for better questions uh, we recognize that and because anybody can do it anybody can learn it so that was one way just one way that we got people to start to, to become more strategic intelligence we made sure people were fluent in uh, better questions and that it was okay to spend time in the question asking and not just react with execution. That people had the, had the right, whether with us or with partners, to deeply understand the type of the problem they were solving, what we expected from them, and to ask as many questions as they wanted um, before they set out to do something. And so we, there's, one, there's one thing we've implemented in our team that's become kind of part of our culture, I have to say, which is briefs. We write briefs, one pagers, and they're often supported very much by the uh, data and insight um, provided by Allison's team, but a, a communications, whether you're a manager, whether you're a, 
as senior VP, somebody asks you to do something, it takes you 10 minutes, it can take you 10 weeks, it could take you 10 minutes, but write a brief. What's the outcome? What do you need to know for this to be successful? Is the outcome really the same as what, what you're being asked to do? Like you get to, here are the following questions I need to know in order to do this well. It has saved so much time for our team in this way. They've been better developed. They learn to be strategic. And when you get to the place where you, and you all know this, you're trying to get approvals for materials before they are published. We ask our partners not to look at details. Is the material on brief or off brief? Because you signed off on the brief. You signed off on the outcome. It is now supported. You know, the execution has been supported by research. It's been supported by all of this. Does this, is this on brief to you? And that has, that has empowered our people to be, not only, it takes so much pain out of their job and they, and they learn what powerful question asking can do. And what, the other piece is better data. Because very frankly, you cannot be a strategic intelligence advisor if you're putting forward ABEs and impressions. So we've all had that conversation, but at the end of the day, they don't tell you enough. And so that's one piece is a commitment to better, better data for partners. The other is a better handoff. Often the handoff is I created a report for your business and I'm sending it to you as a PowerPoint slide or a dashboard and have fun with that. The idea of having the conversation and making sure that that strategists understand the intelligence that they have, that there's a workshopping around the reporting and some discussion is incredibly important. So we've worked also towards having like embed models where we have key analyst leads that work very closely with our content development team, our strategists in the business and corporate centers to make sure that they understand the data, how it's sourced and can make sense of it. So I think if it's just a raw input or a static report, it's not going to be very helpful. So there's a relationship aspect and a data quality aspect to this as well, in addition to having a very well-structured read. You know, Allison, that's one of the biggest trends we've seen across our clients, which are largely Fortune 500 clients across the board. That's where we work, is data quality. I'm glad you brought that up because that's something we have seen a dramatic shift in the last three to five years, just a mindset of, I'm tired of digging through inaccurate whether it's, it's clips that have been pulled from the web or from the news, whether it's analytics and the sentiment isn't right, they're, they're tired of having to clean that up instead of worrying about strategic communications and reaching out across the organization, which is where you and Lauren spend your time. You don't spend your time cleaning up clips. You spend your time planning the strategy, looking for correlations, looking for ways to impact other parts of the organization with data to, to drive the business. Um, I think it was, Laura, you made the comment. I, I wrote it down here. You said communications people have an advantage and an opportunity if they're not afraid to go for it. Mm. Powerful. Can we, communications people have an advantage and an opportunity if they're not afraid to go for it. So, wow, what is the advantage they have and what is the opportunity they have? Because that had me thinking. That's, that's yes. a very bold yes. statement. If you go back... If you go back to the four sort of perspectives, like the power of that holistic perspective and that sense of comprehensiveness, if you're not afraid to assert it, and I'll tell, and I know why it can be scary, but if you're not afraid to assert it, you have the opportunity to expand the sphere of your personal, but also the organization's sphere of influence across a company, any type, any type of company. But the reason it's scary is because you're, if you're doing your job correctly, you're going to be challenging the assumptions of management all the time. And you're going to need to, and, and I think that's, a, that's, a, that's hard to do. Um, people look to communications as a certain single source of truth. I think that's something that we should always aspire to preserve um, of truth and objectivity. I think that underpins as a value why we're communicators, what makes us proud to be communicators. And we now have, you know, we, we look to, to data analytics to, su to support that. But asserting that, um, persuasively challenging assumptions is hard. Now, a, a certain type of leader craves that, wants that, realizes it, it reduces e exposure to blind spots. Not every leader is that way. And you, there's a certain type of resiliency and fearlessness you have to develop to do that well. But as a communicator, if you're confident in certain um, techniques, certainly technology and certainly fluency and, and data, you can make your case con consistently more persuasive. So that's, it takes courage to say, listen, we have a view that's actually not the prevailing view of management right now. Let's just 
go in and present it and see what happens. And, and with the goal of let's get to a better question and a better outcome, sometimes that's effective and sometimes it's not. And there are different, there are different types of leaders to see, see that as, um, some leaders can see that as annoying, other de- leaders see that as deeply, deeply valuable. Well, all the more reason to have quality data and quality yeah. analysis, because you walk in there being contrary to the going opinion, you're going to get thrown out on your rear if you don't have data behind it. You're just, exactly. an, you're just an opinion then, right? Exactly. You can't be just an opinion. You have to go in with the, the, the data gives you conviction. Yeah, exactly. 